So we reconvened uh, after lunch. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, rather than assume that you uh, will just be falling uh, into a post-lunch uh, slump, uh, we will assume that you are now well rested and full of energy uh, for, for the rest of the day and will not hesitate to, uh, to shamelessly exploit that uh, assumed circumstance by exposing you to three presentations in a row. Uh, so uh, fasten your seat belts and uh, uh, ramp up your uh, <laughs> your cognitive systems. Um, so the first, uh, first in the row uh, will be a presentation by Felix Schönbrot, uh, again of LMU Munich, um, who will be talking about uh, the literature on uh, uh, correcting, uh, correcting publication biases, uh, which he will be talking about for us uh, today and give an overview of. Uh, well, very welcome uh, to this, this conference, Thank and you. yeah, please have a go. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, everybody's digesting and tired, and what can there be better than doing them some statistics? So, meta-analysis. Um, there are different opinions about meta-analyses. On the one end of the spectrum, some people say, meta-analysis is at the top of the evidence pyramid, the pinnacle of evidence-based medicine. So, meta-analysis is more or less the best what we can get. This is from the Cochrane collaboration. Well, at the other end, um, we could summarize um, the opinion in three simple words. Meta-analyses are a fact, which is a quote from Mickey Inslicht. So both of these quotes are taken out of context, so it's, it's just to, to show um, the field. Let's go to some specific examples. This is a meta-analysis from psychology. It's about romance, risk, and replications. Can consumer choices and risk-taking be primed by mating motives? We see 43 studies, 42 of them were significant. That's a 98% success rate. And you can see that the uh, meta-analytic random effect estimate is Hohn's D, 0.57, with a very tight confidence interval. And in ancient times, like five years ago, we would have said, this is nailed. There's no reasonable doubt that this effect does not exist. Okay, we have 43 studies. Okay, we have a high confidence in the true effect size as analyzed by a meta-analysis. Now, some statistical background. This is simulated data, and we now see here a funnel plot. May I ask who is acquainted to the funnel plot already? Okay, thanks. Um, so every black point is one simulated study which comes from, from a null effect. So there's nothing but noise, and we get some random sampling variation centered around zero. And here we have the standard error. That means studies with a larger sample size are more on the top of the funnel plot. Uh, and we see that 5% of all black points fall outside of the triangle. The triangle is the region of significance. Everything inside the triangle is not significant, everything outside is significantly different from zero. So 5% of the black dots are outside. Now, what happens if you add publication bias to this plot? And here we have a very simple model of publication bias. Everything that is significant gets published, everything else does not get published. In psychology, around 92% of all published findings are significant. Uh, that's a finding from a study from Fanelli. In the other social sciences, it's around 85%. So really, most of the stuff that we publish is significant. Now we see, um, well, wait a second. Here, something seems missing in the funnel plot. So if you take out all the non-significant stuff in the triangle, and you leave all the significant studies in the published set, you will see something seems to be missing, and that the published studies seem to huddle against the significant threshold over there. And if you do a meta-analysis on these published studies, which are from a true null effect, you will find in this example, for example, a cone C of 0.4. Now what you get in the funnel plot, when you have this sort of publication bias, you get a correlation between sample size and effect size. Usually, sample size and effect size should be uncorrelated. So the funnel plot should be symmetric. But once you add the publication bias, you get this correlation. 
And you see that smaller studies on the bottom, they need a larger effect size to be significant. Okay? And the larger the sample size, the smaller is the effect size. Now, this is the same uh, meta-analysis. We had a forest plot before. It looked quite convincing. Now we take the same data and display it as a funnel plot. Now we can see the suspicious um, picture of the correlation. This is also called small study effects, which just means that small studies show a much larger effect size. And you see they huddle against the triangle. And you can see this projection of the red regression line. And this is already one of the first attempts to correct for publication bias. So the idea is the more you go up, the larger is the sample. And if we extrapolate this line to a sample with infinite sample size, which is the standard error of zero, then the predicted true effect size would be zero. Now, um, they did replication studies based on this effect. And um, they did 14 studies. Remember, the meta-analysis said effect size 0 0.6. There should be something. They did 14 studies, and you won't guess what happened. All of them were not significant. So now the question is, can we correct for publication bias? So we have seen that meta-analyses with dozens of significant studies can come from a real null effect. Um, in other words, can we clean up the mess if we only had the right tool for it? And now I want to show you three attempts how we could correct for publication bias really only quickly. First one is called trim and fill. This was originally designed as a test for publication bias, but it is also used to correct for publication bias. So the test for publication bias means just to check, is their publication bias likely or not? Correcting for publication bias means what is the true effect size if I correct for publication bias, and that usually is smaller than the effect size in the meta-analysis. And trim and fill algorithmically fills in the missing studies in the final plot until the final plot is symmetric. And then you compute the meta-analysis on the imputed data set, and then you get a smaller effect size estimate. Another idea which also works on the final plot is called pet peas from Stanley and Dukuljagos. Um, that's simply the, the idea to extrapolate the regression line of the small study effects, what I said before, to a sample, to an infinite sample size, and then you take this estimate as the corrected estimate. They have two versions. The first, the original version, does a linear regression. It's called PET. And they later said, OK, we could also do a, a quadratic regression, which works better in some circumstances, which gives another correction. Um, yeah. This is the data set from an elderly priming meta-analysis. A third model how you could correct for publication bias is a broad class of uh, so-called selection models. These selection models explicitly model the functional form of publication bias. So for example, you can see here, this is a censoring function which defines which stuff gets published and what not. Uh, here everything's published, and here the idea is that the probability of publishing is conditional on the p-value. Here, for example, only significant studies are published with a probability of 1. Everything which is not significant will not get published. If you have such a selection bias in the literature, your distribution of test statistics will look like that. There's something missing in the middle. So that's a not so extreme as a selection model, which means everything that is significant gets published, and the non-significant stuff has a low but non-zero chance to get published. This will lead to such a distribution of p-values, for example, and this is just another form of possible publication bias. One model that has been applied sometimes is the three-parameter model. This model is the, um, the true effect size and the heterogeneity. This is plain random effects meta-analysis. And additional, as a third parameter, the probability that a study gets published even if it's not significant. And there are much more um, variations of these selection models. If you heard about p-curve and p-uniform, these are actually um, just variations of selection models. 
Now, what we did in the study, we tried to compare the performance of these bias correction methods and to see whether they really can correct for publication bias. Because if that would be possible, it would be great because we can take a, a biased, cluttered literature and arrive at a true value magically. Well, let's see. We did a simulation study with a lot of experimental factors. We had uh, four underlying effect, true effect sizes, different heterogeneity, uh, three levels of publication bias, three levels of p-hacking. We decided to fully cross all conditions. We had 432. Um, it was hard to get through the results <laughs> and to understand the results. So we applied seven or eight uh, correction models to all of these conditions. Um, these are the results. Um, it was hard for us to grasp. This was fully not predictable if you model 432 conditions. Um, and that's why we made an app to understand the results. And I want to show you this app. And um, what we actually hoped for was some main effects. So we hope that some correction methods consistently performed better than others, or at least in some conditions. The problem was it didn't happen. <laughs> there was a lot of interactions. Every single condition had another m method with best performance and so on. And therefore, we made this app. Okay. We can just click through all, of, um, through all these settings. And for example, you can take a look at the funnel plot. And you can see what happens if we add publication bias. So for example, here, we had medium publication bias or high publication bias. If we also add some p-hacking, you can see that you can find the <coughs> typical shape of the funnel plot. And here we can uh, scroll through some different data sets, simulated data sets. So another example. You can take a look at the hypothesis test. So does the meta-analysis indicate a significant effect or not? Um, if there's no bias, you see that actually all methods, oh wait, this a smaller one. All methods, more or less. Okay, no bias. Sorry, no p hacking. Okay, <laughs> now they are at the nominal level or below the nominal level. So it's a five percent false positive rate. But as soon as you add publication bias, you see that the classical random effects model and trim and fill have a false positive rate of fifty percent. If you add some more publication bias, you can see you can easily get a hundred percent false positive rate. Um, you can also look at the estimation. So does it over or underestimate? Um, if you have publication bias and p-hacking, you get overestimation of classical random effects. What is interesting, p-hacking leads to an overcorrection from some bias correcting methods. And sometimes publication bias and p-hacking cancel out each other. So publication bias leads to an overestimation of effects but the correction methods are really sensitive for p-hacking and under-correct for that, and these cancel out, but you cannot really, well, hope for that. <laughs> but it sometimes happens. All right, let's go back to the presentations. Okay. We had the hope that, no, some, one could have the hope. <laughs> that if you do a, a specific meta-analysis, that all these bias-correcting methods converge on a single value, and then everything is fine. It's like a robustness check. Yes, I, I do a couple of methods, and all agree on the same thing. But usually, that will not happen. Usually, they will disagree. Um, that's why we suggest to do a so-called method performance check. You can use the app and say, what conditions are plausible in my meta-analysis? So is this a field where p-hacking and publication is plausible or not plausible? What true effect size is plausible for me and so on? And then you can see in, in your conditions, which apply to your field and your meta-analysis, which method does perform best. And then please do no vote counting. Do not run all the methods and say, well, six say yes, two say no, therefore I conclude yes. 
because even if three out of four methods converge on a value, it can be irrelevant if these three methods are known to perform badly. Okay, so no vote counting, please. But rather do a sensitivity analys analysis, but only using methods which are known to perform well enough. Okay, so that's my last slide. So that's one of the takeaways. Publication bias and p-hacking massively distort the evidence. That's the old garbage in, garbage out phenomenon. So that is not new, but even meta-analysis of many dozen significant primary studies can come from a null effect. And that is something at least I had to learn. As I said five years ago, when there's a meta-analysis on 100 primary studies, very significant, I would have said yes. It's no way that this is not real, but I had to change my mind on that. Um, each type of bias correction from all of these methods, selection models, uh, p-curve, pet piece, and so on, they work in some conditions, but all of them fail in other conditions. The problem is we do not know in what condition we are in. So we do not know the true effect. We do not really know how much p-hacking has been done and so on. But reverting to a naive meta-analysis probably is the worst solution. So saying, okay, all these methods do not work. Let's do a naive random effects analysis. That doesn't work either. So our recommendation is um, do this method performance check and do a sensitivity analysis across many methods. Another point, a systematic review is, of course, much more than just synthesizing statistics. So um, we should rate the primary studies for bias. So there are established, established checklists um, how you can score the bias of primary studies. You should define strict inclusion criteria and so on. And maybe that is the, the main message of my talk. Doing biased research and hoping to correct it afterward does not work. So there's no statistical magic wand uh, which allows us to correct for a cluttered uh, literature. So referring to Arthur's talk, you're talking about clarity and, uh, and the dark clouds. So removing the dark clouds just by some magical statistical technique, yeah, sorry, this will not work. And there's no alternative to making the primary studies better, more transparent, credible, and reproducible. So we have to work on the first studies, on the primary studies, not on better meta-analysis techniques trying to correct for the stuff. There is a useful application of meta-analysis. If you have a bunch of registered reports, which, um, well, where we have no p-hacking because you pre-register the analysis plan and which have no publication bias because they are published regardless of the results, then you can apply very well a random effects meta-analysis across these replications. So that's my last slide. You can read that up in our draft. And two quotes from the paper, researchers should not expect to produce a conclusive debate-ending result by conducting a meta-analysis. Instead, we imagine meta-analysis may serve best to draw attention to the existing strength and or weaknesses in the literature. And these results can then inspire a careful re-examination of methodology and theory followed by, if necessary, large-scale pre-registered replication efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Felix Schönbrot, for this, uh, I would say in some respects, really earth-shattering insights uh, uh, that come from a beautiful, indeed, shiny uh, application. We will have some uh, a room for discussion of uh, of, uh, of these insights um, after our next two presentations. The, the first of which uh, comes from Limor Pierre, <laughs> uh, who joined, uh, who flew over uh, fr uh, the long way from um, Yale University uh, to uh, to Mannheim today to discuss uh, another. Uh, maybe not as contentious field of, uh, of open science yet, but one that I think she will, uh, she will make the case is worthy of being made uh, a contentious, namely open data. 
Uh, we almost uh, we often tend to think that uh, uh, data uh, must be open uh, as soon as it is. Uh, uh, if we are fine and uh, so I can go home, have done our homework, but uh, I think we will learn uh, in our next presentation that there's probably a little bit more to it uh, uh, to do uh, open data right. Uh, and with that, I hand the, uh, the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Thanks for having me here. This is a wonderful opportunity to, have, to speak to a mixed group like this. And um, if I can just see a quick show of hands of how many people are uh, working within the disciplines during their research within the disciplines? Uh, um, in political science and sociology, like in a department doing their research, but interested in open science. OK, great. And then how many people are um, would count themselves as uh, data curation people, library folks, information managers. OK, great. And then uh, any technologists, people who are just doing it. And you could be both. That's fine. OK, great. Well, um, one of the reasons I'm asking is because I, uh, uh, I was uh, uh, brought up in the social sciences. I was trained uh, as a social scientist in commu communication studies. And then I made a switch in my career over the last 10 years into data archiving. And so I uh, am in a position to really see the unique um, contributions um, that can, uh, of each of these perspectives and bringing them together in a way that I think um, has influenced some of the work that we're doing here. Um, and uh, we'll speak more about that. So this is a roadmap for our talk. Uh, today I'm going to spend a bunch of time in the beginning just sort of explaining our perspective um, and then I'm going to talk about this new tool that we have been working on developing that we're calling YARD. Um, so I'm going to talk about computational reproducibility. I'm going to try to make the point that access to research output is not enough. I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of pre-producibility, um, talk about quality and standards, and the process of curating for reproducibility. What does that mean to curate uh, for reproducibility? And then talk about uh, the, yard, um, the yard tool that we've been developing. So in a nutshell, um, YARD is a shorthand for Yale Application for Research Data. It's a proof of concept, really, is how I'm thinking about it. It's an application software that we're developing that has a lot of work, a, a, a long way to go. I think it's just the beginning, but it's a proof of concept. And that concept is curating for reproducibility. And I want to just emphasize that curating for reproducibility is a process. It's something that you don't do once. It's ongoing. Um, and the goal of it is to really make sure that we have quality research outputs um, public, uh, made, made public and disseminated. And another piece to insert in here is that this involves computational reproducibility in our case. I, don't, I, I will spend time talking about computational reproducibility, but I don't think that it is um, uh, confined to that necessarily when we talk about, for example, qualitative, qualitative research. OK, so let's define a few terms. Computational reproducibility, um, what does that mean? Uh, there's not a standard definition for reproducibility. So um, where we sort of um, settled is on this idea of computational reproducibility and this idea that uh, we're only focusing on using original data sets and original methods and being able to reproduce the analysis from materials that are as raw as possible. So sometimes it's really just the analysis in the paper because that's all we have. But ideally, we want to be able to reproduce the entire workflow that the research followed um, from the raw data. So that's where we're, uh, that's where we're going. Um, so um, to do that, we need access to, to these kind of research outputs. We need uh, access to data and code. Um, DART was already mentioned here today. Um, social sciences are at the forefront, with political science in particular, um, really emphasizing this idea that we need to have access to these sort of materials. Um, however, access is not necessarily enough um, to be able to do computational reproducibility. Um, one of the issues that we're having is that 
um, access, as you can see up there um, in this diagram, was the code available, um, is, a, is a main fork in the road. But the other one is computational reproducibility. Are we able to um, reproduce the results from where we've seen. And this idea of computational reproducibility is nice also because it really does bring together um, researchers and data curators as a shared goal. If we want to be able to, um, if we want to be able to be able to computationally reproduce these results in the long term, data curators really have a set of skills that they can bring in to the conversation because they understand how to make things usable for a long time. They understand formats of files. They understand what it means to have to go back over time and come back and say, this doesn't work anymore. The software version is changed and I can't run it. Um, and so computational reproducibility obviously is a, is a, a goal for scientists and researchers, but also for, for curators. So it's desirable. It's something that we want to be able to do. So we talked about access, great, we have access to these things, but access is not enough sometimes because even when we have full access and everybody puts their stuff online in some repository, we find when we actually try to work with the stuff that a lot of information is missing. Things are not documented. There's missing variable labels. There's not uh, the software extensions. Someone forgot to put them and we don't know which ones they used. Um, not to mention issues of uh, software that's outdated and so forth. So these are common problems that really make it difficult to use these materials and to really reproduce the research. So how do we get to just simplify this and give a concrete example? Um, when uh, journals, uh, we've got a manuscript here, when journals require um, uh, the, the, the materials, the data in the code, they usually will get, uh, you know, they'll ask the researchers to put in uh, materials inside a repository. Um, they come in a form of these sort of files. How do we get from there to something like this over here where I could download, I can play with it, and I know that I'm going to get the results that were in the manuscript? That's the question that we're trying to, uh, to look at. So another term that I want to introduce is pre-producibility. Uh, that's uh, a newer term from 2018. Philip Stark came up with that idea to confuse things even further. Um, but the idea here, the, the concept, is to describe in adequate detail for others um, the materials so that they can, so that it's, uh, it's, it's pre-producible, it's uh, reproducible before we even put it out there. Okay. So, and that idea really makes sense um, for across the disciplines. I know that there's, um, uh, well, I won't get into that right now. Um, so this idea of making things um, uh, available in adequate detail to others, for others to undertake it, uh, resonates. Um, um, we've got uh, Gary King's replication standard back in 1995 that's very similar. Again, the idea that a third party who's trying to reproduce these results shouldn't have to go back to the author to ask, what did you mean when you did that? Or how did you do that? It's all there. Um, and so that's what we're trying to, uh, to capture. So curating for reproducibility really combines these two ideas, pre-producibility and computational reproducibility. And we see this as a matter of quality, the quality of the research outputs that we're putting out there. They're pre-producible, so they have all the information already there, and we're able to computationally reproduce them. That's the quality standard that we're trying to, to really establish. So as a quick aside, I have to tell you about uh, where I'm based and why I'm even talking about this. Um, uh, the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale is a, uh, has been around since 1968. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary. It's an interdisciplinary center at Yale for all the social scientists. And we don't have our own faculty, but we have faculty affiliates. So all of our faculty are within the social science departments and they come together to work on issues that require interdisciplinarity um, uh, for the most part. Uh, political science and economists, but we have all the others represented as well, and, on, and to work on problems that really required, um, that, that you know, are for applied research. Um, and one of the main uh, initiatives that ISPS has launched in the last um, 20 years or so is field experiments in political science. So these are randomized controlled trials um, in the field. Um, 
in political science are big uh, efforts around getting out the vote. Um, some of you may know um, have kind of launched that in political science. And so we created about um, seven or eight years ago a data archive to make available all the um, all the underlying materials um, for this body of research. So in other words, we created a database of all these field experiments and then we said, you know, we really want to also make available all the data and all the analysis and all the code and all the interventions themselves and put that out there, open access for the public to use, no restrictions as much as we can with the data um, and just make that available. And so the approach that we've taken is uh, what we think is a responsible approach of an organization that's trying to do that to make sure that the materials that we have are um, pre-producible and compu computationally reproducible. And so we've written a, a bunch uh, on that and you can, you can check that out um, on our website. So another way to think about it is our data archive and our curation process is really the first reuser of these materials that the researchers are putting out there that they're required sometimes by their journals or by their funders to put out there. And sometimes they put it out there because they want to participate in open science. Um, and they put it out there and they, they're, they're done from their perspective, but then someone's gonna try and use these materials and may run into problems. Our staff at the Data Archive are the first reusers. They come up, they in, encounter a bunch of different kinds of problems as we talked about missing labels um, was one example. And we have a whole process to deal with these sort of um, problems. Um, so missing labels um, is one kind of problems with, problem with the data, but we may run into other issues with the data too, right? We might have some kind of weird inconsistencies or errors in the data out of range codes that we, we might want to alert the, um, the researcher to, uh, to look at. We might have issues of confidentiality and privacy. Um, researchers might think that they can put a data set online, but maybe they really shouldn't. Um, so personally identifiable information is a very important um, activity that we engage in. Um, and then there's also issues around uh, copyright and licensing. Um, so these are the kinds of issues that we're looking at um, with data. Um, as, and we've conceived of it as, as what we're calling the data quality review framework. Um, and so there's a data review, which I just sort of mentioned, and then there's file and documentation review. These are typical activities that a data archive would do. Typical things that anyone who's publishing this kind of material um, would say, we really need to check, we really need to make sure we can use it in the long term. Um, what we add to the piece here is this idea of computational reproducibility is what we're calling code review. Uh, it's a little bit different for those who are technologists, a little bit different than what code review is um, you know, for programmers. But here what we mean e is we're asking the question, does the code run? You gave us an R script here or you gave us a Stata do file. Um, can we run it without problems? Is it going to actually run um, on our software and our hardware? Um, and then also, does it reproduce the results that you have in the, in the paper, in the manuscript? That's the piece that we're adding here. So these are the kinds of things I just mentioned. We're running the code. We're taking a bunch of different activities here to make sure that um, for future reusers in the long term, they'll be able to really um, work with these materials. So now I'm gonna shift gears real quick and talk about our process for managing all of this at ISPS. And this is a lot of words on purpose for you to not read, but just to make the point that there's a lot of steps to, to uh, to manage this kind of work within our organizations. I have, um, I have about three graduate students who are helping me with this work, um, and there's a lot of coordination that has to go around and then communication with the researchers every time we have a question. So there's a lot of things that have to happen. So it's a cumbersome process to manage, and that's why we decided we're going to create a workflow tool that we can manage this process, and that's what YARD is. So YARD is really one place where researchers or depositors, they're, they're the people who, who put the stuff into uh, the system, 
um, they can come to it, our curators can work on it from within the same system, and then there's a process of approval um, that administrators can do. And then the nice thing is after all of this kind of like sausage making within YARD, we create these bags and we can put the bags in any data archive or data repository. So they've already got the badge in a sense or some certification of having run through the system, some kind of quality check um, that, uh, that, that has occurred. And so the YARD is a, a workflow tool. It allows depositors, curators, and administrators to submit, review, process, and publish um, data and code within one system. And it sort of helps manage and track everything that's going on. So some of the main features, um, one, it's mostly open source. We do have some dependencies right now, but it's mostly open source. So Yard is available right now for anyone to download and figure out how to deploy it. Um, I can talk a little bit of how we deployed it at Yale. Um, uh, it's modular, so it's policy driven in a sense that if there are uh, quality checks that your organization is interested in, it can implement them. If there are ones that they don't want to do, don't do them. You don't have to do the whole thing. So you could do the whole stack or you could just pick and choose. Um, another nice feature is that it runs on top of DDI uh, metadata production. So DDI is the standard metadata standard um, for um, uh, social science data. And so YARD um, actually creates um, metadata within DDI, um, so then it's machine readable and um, can be absorbed into all the different uh, archives and repositories. And as I said, you can push out the information to wherever you choose to do, uh, to do so. Um, and then I mentioned the three types of users. <clears throat> so I'm gonna do a very brief tour. I didn't have the courage to do a live demo, so I have some screenshots, just a very, very brief tour to get a sense of the tool and a little bit of technical details and some future ideas for extensions, and then, um, then we'll go from there. So data deposit can be done by the researcher, um, and it mostly involves describing the study. Uh, so our, the study is sort of our unit, um, and uploading and describing all the different files. Um, so we see uh, after a description of the study that there's a tab that takes them to describe their methods. Again, in our case, we're focused on experiments and field experiments in particular, but experiments more generally. But that can be, um, that can be uh, adapted. Um, then there's a point for them to uh, upload their files and it's an easy drag and drop to bring in the files. Once files are in there, um, uh, they could see a bunch of information. They can also see on the status, um, if they highlighted each of these little boxes, they'll see what kind of uh, review steps are needed on each of these things. Um, and finally, they can submit to curation. They have to sign a deposit agreement like you would with any, anything else that you deposit in, an, in any kind of archive. Then the curator takes over. The curator can come into the system, look at a study, they get a notification that they are assigned to a study, they look at the study and they go to the review tab and they see all the different things that they need to do. Um, if this was live and I hovered over these blue, any of these blue um, lines, then you'd see uh, a drop down of the files where, where those issues are still open. And they would go one by one, file by file, and uh, review and, um, and do, you know, do what they do in curation. Um, here's just a, a, a sense of how the DDI um, and the variable level metadata is, is working and integrated within the system. Um, changes that you would make here within the system, um, you can republish a data set so that it will include all this new information. So that's a nice feature that we have. Um, once a curator is done, they'll ask, they'll uh, request publication, what we're calling publication, like I'm done with this. Um, and uh, normally, they've already done all of these steps, so they'll, it'll just be done. They'll request publication. I just put this one up to show you what happens when they haven't done some of the tasks that they're supposed to do. The system says, you're not ready to publish. You thought you were ready to publish, but you forgot labels and you didn't check that the code runs, so go back and do that. And then, the uh, or, and then we have a file history uh, as well. Um, so this is just the log that the system runs um, to show everything that happened. It's all logged and, and saved within the system. 
and then uh, an organization like ISPS could decide to make that to be transparent and put that out as well. Right now, it just uh, you can save it as a PDF. That's how we're doing it right now. So uh, the last thing for the administrator to do is to look over, over everything and, and publish. And as I said, once uh, the publication is uh, approved, um, using Bagit, we're creating this bag with a manifest and you know all of the files and all of the metadata and all of the stuff can be pushed um, to other places. So to, to be made publicly available. Um, and so this is again uh, the diagram I showed you before. Uh, this one is like, ah, too much stuff. But I wanted to show you um, the, sort of what's underlying all of this, the architecture that we need to use and some more details. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about that later um, of how, how we had to put it up. Um, again, I'll just mention one little thing, uh, sorry which is the components that, w that are not open source right now, which are uh, Collectica repository down here for our, uh, DDI um, and uh, metadata, and then we're relying on Stata because our, our, um, <clears throat> or we're, we're using Stata, we're not relying on it, but we have to use it because our researchers do. Um, second to last slide, I just wanna talk about potential extensions of YARD. As I said, it's mostly open source, it's modular, components can be swapped out, and it pushes out the material to different places. So we think there's really good potential for integrating this with other tools that are out there, other repositories, and other, um, other tools and software that can help us automate a lot of these um, processes. Last um, slide here is a shout out to some of my colleagues and two my is here in the room. Um, who are also working, uh, not using Yard yet, hopefully they will, but doing this curation for reproducibility processes. And that's the Odom Institute at the University of North Carolina who's working with the American Journal for Political Science um, and doing their third party verification, um, which is the journal policy. Um, and then CICER um, at Cornell, which is offering this as a service. Um, a f uh, they, they charge for it as a service to all social scientists at Cornell. Um, to do this. So, and uh, there's more information also on our little consortium. Um, the slides are available online. So that is all I have, and I'll be happy to take questions or talk to people later. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Limor, for this uh, uh, fascinating uh, presentation uh, on uh, on yard as a facility. So uh, just to uh, just to remind you, we are in the midst of our second block of presentations on advancing open science. So we have now heard uh, one presentation uh, on advancing the quality of doing or maybe even only looking at uh, or looking at meta analyses and what they mean and how we should handle them. Uh, we've heard about uh, how to improve or advance our uh, open data practices, and now we are going to, uh, to hear uh, a presentation by Elena Damian from the uh, KU Leuven, if I pronounced that uh, approximately correctly, um, about how to advance our um, replicability and transparency result reporting standards, you could say, uh, in comparative survey research and, and the, yeah, the sort of taking stock of uh, where we are in that specific important field of social research. The floor is yours. Yes. Okay, so today I'm going to present a study I work together with Bart Mollerman and Wim van Oschert from University of Leuven and uh, regards to transparency and replication in cross-national survey research. So um, transparency is often regarded as one of the foundations of the scientific method, and it has two main functions. To, uh, to enable readers to uh, evaluate the validity and reliability of a study's findings, what we term evaluation transparency, and to enable direct replications by independent researchers, um, and that is replicability transparency. Even though the um, um, the academic community always um, valued transparency. The issues of transparency has only, only moved uh, upward on the academic agenda in the last couple of years. And this is a direct response to increased evidence of failure to replicate experiments, high prevalence of questionable research practices, and reports of cases of misconduct, mainly found in experimental uh, psychology and medical fields. 
However, in the field of cross-national survey research, one of the most popular designs in social science research, this tendency towards greater uh, concern for transparency is largely absent. And uh, at first sight, um, it could be argued that this is a result of the fact that most cross-national survey studies rely on secondary analysis of uh, publicly available data, which enhances transparency and minimizes the risk of um, data fabrication. However, the central argument of our study is that um, there are specific features of cross-national survey research that bring along some particular challenges to transparency. First, the fact that the data is collected in multiple countries yields a high level of complexity. So even if uh, international survey teams manage to produce detailed metadata and document the plethora of uh, methodological issues, it is still not guaranteed that uh, data users who are not involved in the data collection will familiarize themselves with this massive amount of information and succeed in communicating all the relevant information to their readership. So as a result, um, many errors and data limitations uh, are likely to remain hidden from the re uh, readers and even uh, from the authors of these studies. And authors and uh, readers are at risk of holding an overly optimistic view of the uh, data quality of some uh, well-known cross-national studies. For instance, uh, we often see scholars reporting that uh, the data they use is representative for all the um, countries involved, uh, a statement that hides the complex reality of um, covering general populations in multiple countries. Then, uh, conducting secondary analysis on multinational data is often a long and intricate process. And uh, in each step of the research, uh, mistakes, uh, deliberate decisions, as well as unconscious processes can induce bias and consequently distort the findings. Therefore, disclosure of the various steps taken in the data preparation is justified, but requires the um, uh, provision of a uh, large amount of information. Not at least, um, the fact that uh, the, the availability of a huge amount of information prior to the formulation of hypotheses stimulates what Gelman and Locken call data-dependent analysis. So there is an almost infinite um, number of hypotheses that could be tested. So based on the findings of preliminary analysis, decisions are taken, for instance, to use a particular um, modeling strategies, uh, include or exclude respondents, add uh, or remove control variables, interaction effects, and so on. And this process is also not well documented, uh, usually in the articles. So, uh, the main motivation for our study was to open the debate about transparency in cross-national survey research. And the first uh, contribution is theoretical. Uh, we provide an overview of the measures taken to, in, to achieve transparency in cross-national survey research. And uh, we do so by developing a model of the actors, factors, and processes that influence the level of transparency in, this in an academic article. Then uh, we provide some empirical evidence regarding the current reporting practices in cross-national survey research. And we also developed a, a checklist for re reporting uh, this type of research. And in this presentation, I will mainly focus on the second contribution. So what did we do? Um, to evaluate the current reporting practices, we analyzed a random sample of 305 comparative studies. We first selected all social science journals that um, accept manuscripts on a variety of topics that are um, published comparative research and that are written in English. 
Then we selected all uh, articles that used as a main data set, one of seven international surveys uh, that offer free data access, and you can see the list of the surveys on the website, on, the, on this slide. Uh, also included articles uh, that um, cover in their analysis five or more countries, um, include data from one or uh, more waves, and that they do, that don't have um, purely methodological aim, so they answer a substantive research question. This selection resulted in uh, over 1,000 uh, academic articles, from which we drew a sample, random sample of 305 articles. Uh, we checked each article manually and um, re re uh, coded whether they provide three types of information. Background information about the survey data or contextual data from external sources data preparation procedures and replication materials. So, let's see what we found. In this uh, table, you see the percentage of articles disclosing information about data and sampling. Um, these descriptive findings are striking in the sense that a uh, large uh, big number of the studies fail to, uh, to provide sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, information about the representativeness of the survey data that they use. So, uh, for instance, uh, the mode of uh, data collection is, is mentioned in 16.4% of the articles, the, and this is a key element in data collection. Information about how the sample is obtained is often missing as well. You can see here that uh, two out of five articles provide a description of the population to which their conclusions were generalized. Response rate, a uh, key uh, indicator of data quality, is mentioned in less than one in 10 out of 10 articles. Um, here it's interesting to mention that we coded whether this information is present in the article, but we didn't code it whether the information is correct. And I'm mentioning this here because um, we noticed that many articles that use data from European Social Survey reported that the response rate is 70%, while this is the target or ideal rate, not the actual rate. Then 28.4% uh, uh, of, um, of the articles uh, mention the use of weights. And this finding is also surprising because most of cross-national survey studies advise their data user to include weights in their analysis. For instance, a uh, European Social Survey has um, a relevant guide uh, where they mention from the first page that you should use weights if you want to obtain robust estimates. Uh, going to the second table, here you can see the percentage of articles disclosing information about the measurement of uh, the dependent variables and the contextual level variables. Um, you can see that um, some 70% of the articles uh, mention the exact question or item uh, by which the all the dependent variables were measured and 58% uh, of the articles mentioned the full range of answer categories. These values decrease to 34% when uh, it comes to the aggregated contextual variable. So an example of this type of variable will be average trust or average religiosity. Um, and regarding the contextual variables from external sources, for instance, um, GDP measuring economic development, you can see that only 34% of the articles mention the year of the data they use for all the contextual variables, 78% uh, mention the source of the data, and only 43% mention the reference to the data source. So uh, we combine all these vari various indicators into two uh, transparency indices, reflecting evaluation transparency and replicability transparency, which I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, here you can see the percentage of academic <coughs> articles by the two transparency indices. So if you look at the first graph and you add the percentage of articles that have a 
evaluation transparency index between 0 and 0 0.5, you see that 70% of the articles provide half or less of the information that you would need to evaluate the validity and reliability of a study findings. And if you do the same, the information from the second graph, you would see that 46% of the articles provide half or less of the information needed to uh, attempt a direct replication. So overall, um, these findings uh, show um, a picture of the level of uh, transparency in cross-national survey research. Even though all articles provide some, um, some information, most of them they don't provide enough uh, information to evaluate the, uh, the validity of the findings and um, to try to replicate these findings. I forgot to mention here that um, most of the articles in our sample that were published in public opinion quarterly had very high values on both transparency indices. And this one explanation for this is the fact that um, of the 29 journals that we included in our study, uh, Public Opinion Quarterly was the only one where they specifically say in the submission guidelines that authors must uh, provide background information about the, da the data they use. Um, these findings also show that there is a need not to only create but implement uh, transparency policies and guidelines in this field. And in this, uh, in this sense, we created a, check, a reporting checklist to help scholars um, achieve greater transparency in their work, in their studies. Um, and you can see here briefly our um, Checklist. The checklist is composed of 23 art, uh, article, um, items about uh, what we consider to be the most crucial method methodological information in cross-national survey, survey research and covers information among others about the survey data use, sampling, um, individual and contextual variables. Um, and also very important to mention is that in principle the information that we propose in this checklist can be communicated to the scientific community in various ways. In the article, as an online supplementary material on the website, as a specific um, reference, uh, we strongly believe that the medium is of secondary importance and what really matters is that this information can be found uh, without a long search. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Elena. Uh, so we've now heard uh, about three different ways in uh, which we uh, collectively could uh, advance different aspects of the wide uh, spectrum of, uh, of open science. Uh, lots of input, uh, it's really uh, extended presentations you could say, so I'm assuming there must be, uh, the audience must be filled with questions at this point. Uh, um, if you have questions for any one of the three speakers, please lift your hand in the back. Thanks. Uh, my name is Bert Bakker. I have a question for the, the YARD presentation. Um, so if I go back uh, on, uh, on Monday to my home institution and, and tell the director about, about YARD, he would be enthusiastic, but he would also ask me, uh, well, what does it cost? And uh, can you give me an like a bit of an impression of what is the resources needed? Because um, I can, a little bit of background, it, essentially my, my department wants me to do all this, uh, deposit the data, have everything there. But I don't. I doubt we have the, the the capacity to really have people check all this at the moment. So I'm curious if I what would be the arguments to convince them, and also related to the trade-off of the cost. No, great question. Um, one way to answer this, um, and it's not trying to get out of answering it, but I think it's true, is that I think the scientific community has to commit to doing this, and then we'll find ways. In general. Um, but it is a concrete question about you know, who, how to pay for this and how much does it cost. So um, I'll start with my institution and then I'll mention Cornell, which has a different model. So in our K-12 
case. Um, the volume is not very big. Um, uh, so it's not that we're dealing with like a flood of stuff coming in. Um, so um, it's been a commitment on the part of our, uh, of two directors now of ISPS to, um, to do this and um, to cover the cost. So we're not going out and charging anyone, um, and it's not funded by, by an external thing. We're, it's, it's part of the infrastructure and the services and support that, that are provided by our center. Um, how much does it cost? So I think um, the average work that, so the main cost is the curation. Okay, so the techno technology pieces are, are really negligible. So it's the labor. And so I think that our estimate is that our, the range is somewhere between two to eight hours on each study um, of work, um, and then figure out the pay that you rate your graduate student for an hourly. Um, some cases are longer, and some cases are not. What we have found, and I can say that um, I don't have hard data, which I, I'm, I should, um, but that the, the time has been going down. Why? Because they're used to it now. They know that we are gonna, they're gonna give us the materials, we're gonna come back to them with questions, and they don't wanna be bothered. So they're doing a much better job of documenting, giving us all the labels that we need in the data file, giving us commented code, putting the code in better, you know, in, in a more elegant code that's, that makes sense and is uh, sequential. Um, so, you know, giving us a readme file so we know where to start. All of these things take a lot of time if you don't have them. So we're educating our researchers. Um, and so I think that has to go hand in hand with just you starting it out, out of the gate. So that's my answer. At Cornell, as I mentioned, um, and I don't want to speak for them, I don't know their numbers, um, but they, they give you maybe like two hours free, I believe. Um, and then I think, and then after that, if they need more work, they'll charge you. So the departments charge each other somehow over there. Um, and then another model for doing this is where the journal pays for it, because the journal has made the commitment, and that's what Odom is, is, is doing. So, yeah. Uh, so, question for sort of uh, you again, Lee Moore. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, at lunch, I was talking to your colleague from North Carolina, and I used a strange analogy, which I think does capture something. I said, it's like passing someone a, a restaurant menu and saying, can you try and cook these dishes for me? Yeah, yeah it's kind of impossible. Um, but yeah, so, so basically, we are talking about, in different guises, all these talks are, are talking about kind of recipe books. Um, you know, one of the things that some of the things I've been doing have been bedeviled with, it only takes one pip install at the command line and somebody else can't do something, or it only takes one unusual library in R that's come from a different mirror, or one of these sorts of problems. And I've spoken a lot with computer scientists about this, and, um, and you know, they've been variously unsuccessful sometimes at actually cloning machines and, and this sort of thing. So I think there's something that's going to be a challenge, but not one we should shy away from, one we can go forward to. And keeping the, the sort of recipe um, analogy going, I remember certainly in Britain, there were a few uh, cookery magazines, sort of 1950s-style cookery magazines, uh, essentially for women at that time, uh, where they used to have the kind of uh, the triple recipe test. And it was not only could another woman test it, uh, produce it, could an another woman do it with different ingredients uh, or diff different, uh, from different producers, and then could a third woman do it with different ingredients and also a different style of oven. And I think we probably need something along that lines to kind of really think about absolute reproducibility, but thanks. Yeah, if I can just respond, yeah. Um, no, great, great comment. And um, a couple things I wanted to talk about. One is that there's a, in, in that work of doing the computational reproducibility, I think we'll have, and we have to some extent, some technological uh, or technical solutions already. So there are things out there that are already um, saving the computation itself, and that will reduce the cost as well, right? So, so to uh, capture the, the computational co uh, capsule, you can call it, the, the code and the data, um, and make that a research object, and um, so that, that's possible too. Um, I, I'll just um, give a shout out to a project that we have at Yale um, at our library that's funded by Sloan right now on emulation as a service. 
and we are going to work with them on data. They're, they're mostly focused on um, digital objects in the arts and things, um, not only, but mostly, and we're going to work with them on this. So, so the idea that, um, uh, yeah, I can save the, I mean, you're right, in a kitchen, in a recipe, it's impossible maybe to recreate the exact conditions every time, but on, on a computer, you can. We can just save it. Um, and so if we can have a good way to do that and then emulate um, all the hardware and all the systems so that we know we can have that preserved and going forward, it'll always show you the same thing. We can do that. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed the talk on the survey um, reporting standards, but I left myself wondering whether the journal article is always the right place to report these things, right? I have a limited word count, and as you yourself noted, a lot of the things that they reported were knowable, right? The European uh, Social Survey reports a lot of that information. Is it really necessary for me to repeat that information in the journal article if I have a proper citation to the um, documentation of this study that I'm using, right? For example, do I actually have to uh, report every single independent control variable that I use with question text and answer options if I link to the code book? I only have, you know, 8,000 words. Uh, yes, so um, we, we say that um, if you give a specific um, reference, then that's fine. You don't have to provide, for instance, the report, uh, response rates for every country that you included. But if you give a uh, reference to the document where you can find the response rate or the exact uh, or the exact the questionnaire of the survey, then that's enough. But what happens nowadays is that most researchers they just mention we use European Value Study check European, European value study org and that's it. And that will not be enough because as I said, uh, met metadata documents can contain thousands of, uh, of um, pages. So providing a specific um, reference will be enough. So in the whole thing. Uh, one question for uh, Lee Moore. Um, so it's um, great stuff that you're doing, and uh, maybe we could also part of this, use part of this for, for students uh, as a guide for improving their code when they have their studies. Um, but my question is, so at what point do you stop when it comes to reproducibility? So I mean, when you use R, there might be a package update, and then the code doesn't run anymore, or after two new data versions, something is still it's again different with their data format. So do you also keep track of this over time or try to try to achieve reproducibility over platforms or do we just do it within the context or environment that the original also used? Yeah, so first of all, on the educational, I absolutely agree with you. I think that that would be a very good uh, use of, of this for teaching and, and educating. Um, on the software, so uh, I think, you know, one strategy would be to try to do this sort of emulation of the original computational environment, and then that's the thing that's going to reproduce the result. But obviously, if someone wants to try to take that and use it today, something that was done 10 years ago, um, and they want to do it to download everything and do it on their own machines, they could run into problems. Um, we, we have... Uh, uh, an ideal that we're striving for, we haven't done it with all of our studies, and that is to rewrite Stata code into R um, and try to reproduce the same results, um, so to take it out of proprietary and into open source, um, with the idea that the R community is robust and ongoing and isn't going to go anywhere, and that you know there's always going to be someone who can say, oh, if you had this problem, you know, try. You know, this package has been updated, that's why you're having that problem. And so there's a kind of a community support in a sense around that. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll say about that is that yes, um, we have the intention in working with our, our library to, um, to make sure that we maintain the versions of the software that's necessary and update 
update the files and update everything. Um, but it's, um, that's a commitment on the part of, uh, of our library um, that is still you know, being worked out. Um, but you know, to your point, it shows what is really required if we're serious about you know, why are we sharing these materials if not for long-term use, and this is what it takes to be able to use it in long-term. Not forgetting our first presenter. Uh, I think it's an hour ago now, but you you, you should still remember it. Others. But, but I am going to ask something about the the third uh, presentation, if that's okay. Um, I, I think if if I may suggest an extension, because I uh, am building upon the the other question that was asked for you. If you could extend this to also look at the rep replication files of these studies, I would be more or less uh, convinced about the problem that you're raising. Because if also in the in the R code or in the state of it becomes unclear how, for instance, uh, an independent or dependent variable is constructed, then uh, not reporting that in the main text of the paper or in the appendix seems more problematic to me than uh, as as your the previous questions asked you if it's. If I can get it from the replication file, I would be less worried that it's not explicated in the paper itself. So, are you thinking about doing that extension uh, uh, with with this project? For you, Elena. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought it was for the first presenter. <laughs> Can you can you repeat the question? So basically, what I'd like to ask you is, are you thinking about extending this? Because if if people don't report, uh, say the, uh, the 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 specific item numbers that are used from the European Social Survey, yes. that seems to me not a huge problem. If I can go to the replication file, download the data, and see, oh, it's uh, a sixteen uh, B that's being used. If the replication file is a mess and there's just a composite of social ideology. That seems a much bigger problem to me. So what I suggest as an extension is to look at the replicate, to, to see to what extent there's a mismatch between what has been reported in the paper and the replication file. So yeah. can I directly replicate the replication file? Okay, then I don't really see that much of a problem, but if yeah. the replication file is a mess, there's maybe a bigger problem. So um, in the um, 305, uh, articles, I think only four of them provided replication files. So uh, having a replication file in this moment uh, is unfortunately not an option. So that's why uh, we, we say that it's important either to give the um, reference to the, the questionnaire or the question item or because sometimes, for instance, uh, you have education and you have different measures for education. So that's why we say it's important to give the, um, the exact uh, name of the item. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, in sociology, there are not many papers who provide replication files. Yeah, so. Yes, and so in our uh, paper, we also make some um, recommendations for different actors of the academic community and how, um, for instance, journals, for journals, how important it is to require um, authors to provide replication materials and so on. So, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. My name is Joachim Wackerow, I'm from GESIS, and I'm uh, very involved in the development of DDI, it was mentioned. Uh, I, I have more comment here on, on the computational replication. I, I, I think a precondition of all these replication ideas is transparency of used methods. And in this sense, I think uh, yeah, algorithm, algorithmic replication uh, should, should come first and then computational because the computational is very much dependent as you, as you ask uh, yeah, from, from a specific software, from a specific version of a software and things like that. But uh, the, the published code is not per se transparent. 
I, I know a lot of open source uh, software which is published, but nobody understands the code. So you can write code in this way or that way. You, know? you can document it or you can don't document it. So I, I, I'm not sure how to approach this really, but uh, do you have any ideas or thoughts on that? Um, to be honest, I haven't gone there, but but I uh, appreciate the point, and we have thought about about that. But haven't gone there in a the sense of I don't <laughs> I don't know what to do about that necessarily. Um, I think that um, yes, of course, you're right. We need that transparency. I think if we have a community um, and we have uh, you know conventions around this. And we have um, incentives. We talked about incentives for transparency at all these levels. Then, then we can get some of the way there. I, I, um, I don't know that I could say much more than that about that right now. Um, I think you know when we're starting to talk about reproducibility, there's so many things in that orbit. Um, you know, we talked about computational reproducibility being kind of a fork in the road to, to replicating studies. Um, you know, I, I do want to emphasize that we're not doing any sort of, any, any, uh, any sort of scientific replication. In other words, we're, we're not in a position to say, was this a good method to use? Um, have they really done what they said they're going to do? Or would they, you know, if there's a pre-registration, obviously we'll include that. But um, you know, there's a lot of other questions that are swirling around that. I think that transparency goes wide and deep. <laughs> yeah. What? Yes. Just one more comment. Uh, that, that, that's happening in the in the world of national statistical offices. Uh, a network of NSIs are working on a on a. Uh, abstract language, a formal language. So the idea is to to uh, transform R code or starter code or SAS code to this generic pseudo code, which doesn't run on any engine, and then it can be transformed again to a specific software. You know? So and and that's the idea to to yeah to be capable to replicate something over time, over a long time, you know, and to preserve it. That's uh, certainly an, a whole new aspect, open code, uh, that, uh, that we are touching on here, which I uh, find super interesting and, uh, and thought-provoking. Are there any other questions in the room? Because I would have one for the first presenter. <laughs> She's almost fallen asleep at this point, but <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, coming from a field in, uh, or working in a field in which uh, if uh, meta-analyses are either the pinnacle of, uh, of uh, academic uh, knowledge production or uh, fucked, uh, I would say they were certainly regarded more, uh, more than, uh, as the former than the latter uh, still. Um, um, obviously, your, your talk had a, a lot of implications for uh, practitioners who want to conduct uh, meta-analyses, uh, implications for how they should approach that. Um, I was wondering if you plan on um, coming up with specific guidelines, or maybe you uh, uh, have done this already, for reviewers of meta-analyses. Uh, uh, there are lots of journal submissions. I certainly uh, got a couple of them at this point. Uh, of meta-analyses uh, that are largely, uh, yeah, let's say, agnostic about uh, the issues you've uh, you've mentioned, and I've uh, been struggling a lot with uh, with how to respond to these kinds of uh, submissions based on your uh, really really great work on uh, in this area. I'd be interested on what your approach would be like uh, as a reviewer of a, a submitted meta-analysis in the social sciences. There was a nice research project by Daniel Larkins and colleagues. They tried to reproduce existing meta-analyses. In most cases, it was not possible at all. Mm. So the, the first and foremost 
thing we need is the raw data of the meta-analysis, like the effect sizes, sample sizes, the extracted data from the primary studies as a machine-readable file, because then you can start to do a secondary analysis and run all these bias correction methods on the data, um, on the meta-analysis, and just see how the correction, well, tunes it down or not, and whether they agree or not, but this can only be done if you have the raw data of the meta-analysis. And um, many meta-analysts analysts are like mad if the primary studies do not report the necessary effect sizes. So they have to go to the authors and uh, request the sample sizes and so on. But they should do the same and report the numbers they use for the meta-analysis. Mm. And if this is open, we can do a secondary data analysis and see whether a new method has a new hunch about the existence and the size of the effect. Oh, great, certainly uh, very practical uh, uh, information for, for reviewers of meta-analyses that I think, uh, I would assume, are not currently uh, followed at this point. <laughs>